Good afternoon, or indeed good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the latest in the series of Health Foundation webinars exploring aspects of improvement science. My name is Bill Lucas, and beside me in London is Naomi Fulop, Professor of Healthcare, Organisation and Management at University College London, who will be co-presenting today. Hi, Naomi. Hi, Bill. And uh, we're delighted to welcome in Toronto uh, Ross Baker, Professor of Health Policy and Management at the University of Toronto. Thank you so much for joining us, Ross. Thanks very much, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's my pleasure to be coordinating the Improvement Science Program for the Health Foundation and facilitating this conversation today. Our topic is, where in the world is improvement science? It will be presented by Naomi and Ross, who've undertaken the first full scan of improvement science centers across the world. We'll follow our normal format. That's to say, after about 30 minutes or so of presentation, I'll invite you to engage with our expert practitioners. But from the moment we start, please do type and send questions and comments so that I can put those to Naomi and Ross. And now, Ross, let me invite you to start our webinar. Ross. Thanks very much, Bill. Um, Naomi and I are going to talk about this scan, which, as you said, we did in the last year for the Health Foundation. And we focused on this large-scale umbrella term, improvement science, because there is no one term that, that really includes the full range of activities. And by improvement science, we mean activities around patient safety, quality improvement, implementation science. There's a whole range of different terms that people have used in different settings around the world. But they all have common roots. They have common roots in the practical activities to improve care, to improve work, uh, and to re use research and the tools of a variety of dis disciplines to really understand how to make that improvement work more effectively. Um, so we, we focused on this issue of trying to understand where in the world is improvement science. And I've moved forward to our, our first slide, which provides a sort of graphic view of the, of the world. And Naomi will talk about the map that we've developed. So thanks, Ross. Yes, one of the really useful, we hope really useful outputs of the scan uh, is to provide you uh, with a map of the world and where the improvement science centers that we found are located. Uh, so you'll see from this a, no a whole number of blue dots uh, which indicate uh, where the improvement science centers are. And I should at this point uh, give a health warning in that uh, we can't say we've, we've included every single improvement science center in the world. Or we had a very good go at it, but I'm sure there are some missing. And as you'll see, um, there uh, is a bias uh, towards uh, the Northern Hemisphere in terms of North America, the UK and mainland Europe. However, we have included some in Australia. Um, but as I said, um, it, it does seem these where they seem to be located, but we haven't managed to include every single one in the world. Um, if you wanted, the way you can use this map uh, uh, by clicking on the URL uh, uh, at the top of the first uh, uh, screen that you saw, if you say wanted to look at the Improvement Science Centres in London, you can um, zoom in on London and um, when you've done that, you can see uh, all the blue dots in London that show the improvement science centres there and you could click on one to um, have a bit more uh, detail. However, mo moving north in, in England, not to be London centric, um, here's an example of the Institute of Health and Society, which is based at Newcastle University. Uh, and you can zoom in on that and you can see um, if you click, it says, uh, please click here uh, to uh, view their website. And you can go direct to their website and find out what this uh, institute is doing. So we hope you find uh, this output useful, which is available uh, on the Health Foundation uh, website. And I'm now going to pass back to Ross, who's going to tell you uh, in a little bit more detail how we carried out the scan. So the scan was commissioned by the Health Foundation to really support a variety of programs that they're engaged in improvement science. And they're particularly interested in developing a greater cohort of scientists who can contribute to this work in the UK and elsewhere. Um, so the work was carried out by a team in two centers, Naomi's group uh, in London, uh, at University College London, and a group here in Toronto with Kaveh Shajonia, Alicia, Alicia Lowe, and myself. The aim of the scan was really to 
provide us with a sense of where the work is going on. Where is the practice-based and research activities that really are advancing improvement science um, in the UK, Europe, North America, and elsewhere in the globe? Uh, we focused on understanding the programs of research, the programs of graduate, postgraduate study, and the development and service demonstration projects that are going on in major centers not all the centers, but major centers around the world, to inform, as I said earlier, the Health Foundation's activities in this area. We did it in two steps. The first step, we used Google searches and other, other web searches to identify improvement science centers around the world, created a database of these um, with a variety of information about who was in the center, what the activities were, what the sources of funding were, what the educational programs were, and then we made contacts to flesh out that database with informants, key informants in Europe, England, North America, and elsewhere, and looked at materials available in the small, relatively small number of articles and other resources in journals uh, and other so sources. Then we focused in from that database on the larger centers, and we had a series of criteria, which you see here, to distinguish the centers that had a corpus of ongoing activity that gave them the opportunity to move into improvement science in a large-scale fashion. We, we, we reached out to the directors and other key personnel, and we carried out interviews in a variety of these centers, asking the questions about what is the focus of your work, how do you, how do you define improvement science, what are the areas of research and practice that you're engaged in, and what are the issues you see moving forward to expand your activities. This, this data was then taken in to analyze the patterns of this work in England, the UK, and Europe, and North America to try to understand the history of these centers and try to understand the opportunities and challenges as we move forward to create a larger, more robust corpus of activity in improvement science. So let me say, say a little bit about what we found. Uh, in our initial search, we identified about 100 centers around the globe. Uh, we ended up focusing on about 80% uh, of those, and then we carried out interviews with about half of the ones that we identified as having fairly large scale. Um, we reached out to many centers that we were unable to, to contact, but I think we've, we received enough information from rep representative centers in England, UK, and North America to really understand the state of current activity. One of the interesting patterns here is the the history of these centers has really determined a lot of their focus. And so the current range of centers is really quite heterogeneous in the types of activities, the types of research and practice activities they engaged in. Many of them, of course, were initiated with specific grants on particular topics, which set their in motion a pattern of, acti of these activities. And as a result, gave them a, an opportunity to really focus in on specific issues. But but often not to have a broader range of, of, of ideas and, and activities as well. So as you can see, there's a, a large number of, of particular types of, of activities. Uh, we, we included patient safety, quality improvement. There's activities where centers are focused on really lean issues, centers that are focused on more policy-related issues. And many of, these, many of these centers have combined not only research but educational activities in a broad um, a set of, of activities that engage not only academic uh, partners, but healthcare partners as well. So I'll pass it on to you, Naomi, to say a little bit more about the UK uh, centres in particular. Thanks, Ross. So in terms of the development of the centres in the, the UK, the context has very much been the prioritisation of translational research in the last seven or eight years. Um, the idea of this second translational gap that was, it was identified by Cooksey uh, in his report um, identified the gap between research in t uh, on health services, on health technology, uh, and actually what's implemented in practice. And several initiatives, large-scale initiatives, have been developed to try and close that, that gap. Uh, and for example, particularly through our National Institute for Health Research. And these are some examples. Uh, for example, the collaborations in leadership in applied health research centres, uh, terribly clunky acronyms, so they're known as CLARCs. There are nine of these centres around England, and um, almost £90 million has been invested in these centres uh, in the last five years um, to undertake uh, research to apply it in practice uh, in the NHS. And other examples include the Patient Safety and Service Quality Research Centres and the Programme Grants for Applied Health Research, 
also funded by the National Institute for Health uh, Research. In terms of the uh, thinking of the centres as a whole, um, almost all the UK centres are geographically located in university cent centres. However, uh, a third of them uh, are formal partnerships between uh, universities and, and healthcare organisations. And in many of them, the funding goes directly to the healthcare organisation uh, first uh, and then goes to their partner university uh, organisations. In terms of the types of research uh, that are being, uh, uh, that's being carried out, there's a whole wide range, uh, but includes patient safety, organisation delivery of healthcare, public health uh, and um, implementation. In terms of um, the education, there's a very strong focus at master's, doctoral and postdoctoral levels, um, many centres supporting large numbers of PhD students. And um, a number of centres have developed mechanisms or innovations to build uh, improvement science knowledge between universities and healthcare environments to translate that knowledge. So, for example, the clerks that I've mentioned uh, have established diffusion, diffusion fellows, and that initiative is actually being evaluated currently. Um, the King's Patient Safety and Service Quality uh, Centre established a second D programme, and these uh, initiatives um, whereby people in, who work in healthcare, managers and clinicians and so on, um, can actually come and work in the centres and help translate research evidence into practice in healthcare. So we've given you quite a lot of information at the moment, so I think it's time to pause for a moment and reflect on, on what you've heard so far. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Naomi. Uh, one question already uh, come in, and it's a very straightforward one, easy one to answer. Will the slides be available after the webinar? Yes, they will. Uh, the slides and the webinar itself will be on the Health Foundation's website. So that's an easy one to answer, but uh, don't let me stop you sending them in. Um, I'm struck by the variety of centres that you found, uh, Ross, and I'm just sitting here wondering uh, whether or not uh, improvement science, as you mentioned, is a it's a relatively new term. I wonder how often you found the term itself actually being used by those you interviewed. Well, I think actually not very often, Bill. I think we, the term improvement science is meant to be inclusive, but people have their own focus in patient safety, quality improvement, uh, human factors, and I think that's been the banners under which people have done this work. So one of the opportunities that are and is in front of us is this opportunity to see the link between these different centers and the ways in which the methods and focus that they have will contribute to a broader understanding of how to create a more unified uh, sense of the disciplines and knowledge that is necessary to improve healthcare. Thanks. And um, Naomi, from your perspective, looking at uh, the different centers, uh, has it uh, enlarged your conception uh, of improvement science? What have you learned from, from doing it? I think it's really uh, underlined the importance to involve a whole range of disciplines and professions um, in the improvement science um, task, really. Mm -hmm. So everything from engineering to anthropology uh, and including um, medical professions and the nursing professions, allied health professions, managers and so on, um, that that very broad base is needed in order to develop improvement science. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go a little deeper now, and I'm going to invite Naomi to uh, show us a few of the UK examples. Yes, yeah, so we'd just like to show you um, four examples from the UK, um, and we've chosen these to really give you the, the range of approaches to improvement science uh, centres and the models. And the first is uh, one I've already mentioned from the map, the Institute of Health and Society at Newcastle University, where they've brought together um, all the work um, that was going on in the university um, uh, relevant uh, under in, in, in one purpose-built building, uh, in fact. And they're um, conducting research on patient safety and health economics and behaviour uh, change, uh, looking at public health, applied health interventions and an and, and, and organisation of care. And they have um, a, a whole a number of PhDs and postdoc fellowships and they're collaborating very closely with uh, local uh, NHS organisations and share joint research uh, with their local uh, NHS uh, trusts. Uh, the second example is one of these clerks that I've also already mentioned, and this one is in, in, in the southwest uh, of England. Uh, it's called Southwest Peninsula, 
and um, their uh, research is focusing on um, clinical uncertainties and how to effectively improve health services. And this collaboration is a formal partnership between local NHS organisations and universities in uh, Devon and Cornwall. And the topics of research they're focusing on are particular health conditions like stroke and hypertension and a particular ways of trying to improve healthcare through technology, such as online networks, for example. Again, they have a whole number of PhD uh, uh, students and staff who can support uh, 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 PhDs. And in particular, uh, this clerk um, is involving end users of the research and, and service uh, users in their work uh, to improve healthcare. Uh, the third example is the uh, Social Dimensions of Healthcare Institute, which is a partnership between two universities, uh, building on different strengths, pulling them together um, uh, to really kind of punch above their weight, as it, as it were, to try and make a difference. And the two universities are um, at St Andrews, building on their strengths in social science, sociology and anthropology, and Dundee University with their uh, strong clinical uh, focus. And again, they, they have a big uh, postgraduate uh, education program. Um, and in addition to the partnership between the uni two universities, um, they have strong local collaboration with uh, local healthcare partners. The fourth uh, example is um, in Wales at the University of uh, Bangor. It's called Implement at BU. Um, and they are collaborating with, again, with local NHS organizations, but also um, with international academic partners, and they're focusing uh, particularly on evaluation, methodological innovation, and carrying out work not just in hospitals but also in in uh, care care homes. And again, they have um, a professional uh, doctoral program for senior healthcare uh, managers and uh, master's level training. So that's just uh, four examples uh, of centres uh, from across the UK which illustrate the different kinds of models of improvement science centres. And now I'm going to pass back to Ross who will give some examples from uh, the North American context. Uh, thanks, Naomi. I, I think uh, there's some interesting similarities but also differences in the experience in North America. And one of the interesting sort of trends we saw was that the the period at which centers emerged had a big impact on the focus and nature of their activities. And in the 18, 1980s and 1990s, there were a number of centers that emerged that were really led by pioneers in this area. And so one example would be the work of Pascal Carrion and her group at the University of Wisconsin, which really was centered in the Department of Engineering and centered on human factors and the use of engineering skills and understanding how to improve the, the situation and, and delivery of health care. The work of Paul Batalden, Gene Nelson, and others at Dartmouth Medical School in the United States was also seminal in creating a, a curriculum around safety. It was broad-based um, and developed a series of, of activities and strengths that I think uh, have helped to, to uh, spark a number of activities in other schools. We also have to mention the important work of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in the U.S. And they linked with a number of large healthcare systems, primarily in the U.S., but in Canada and elsewhere, uh, to create improvement science activities that were focused in academic medical centers. And I think one of the differences between North America and the U.K. is that in North America, a lot of this work has been partnerships between academic and practice-based organizations, but much of the focus has been in the academic medical center rather than in the university. And so it's been more clinically focused and more focused on practical work uh, to make this, uh, make this activity happen. The sea changed around the turn of the millennium, 2000, uh, with the release of the important IOM reports to Air is Human and Crossing the Quality Chasm. And a number of things happened to that in the, in the wake of that, one of which was some important funding from, from ARC in the United States, which focused on patient safety and which developed a number of centers in the U.S. Uh, with particular emphasis on imp in improving patient safety and doing practical research around safety-related activities in medicine, informatics, and so forth. More recent uh, improvement science centers have really focused on new ideas and new sources of funding, including work around clinical effectiveness and translational work. 
When we look across all the existing centers um, in the U.S. and Canada, there's a broad range of different activities. But one thing is clear that many of these centers have particular areas of focus. And many centers which have been pretty broad in their areas of focus are now becoming increasingly focused, particularly on informatics, uh, medication safety, and other areas where there are existing or emerging uh, opportunities for funding. So we see a variety of specific uh, strengths that come in these centers, but also the sense that because they're becoming increasingly focused on strategic issues, there may not be the same range of activities in patient safety and other aspects of, of uh, improvement science. So I've said a little bit about research. Let me say a little bit about education. Um, and I think that part of the history of improvement science centers in North America being based in um, academic medical centers uh, in, the, in the hospital side of, of the partnerships has been that, uh, as a result, many of their educational activities have been short courses really focused on, on developing staff knowledge and skills around safety and quality, and very few dedicated academic programs, masters and PhD programs, emerged until quite recently. Uh, and where they did emerge, they were generally part of much larger health services research and other programs, so they didn't have the same scope and the same opportunity for development. More recently, however, new master's programs have developed um, in, in Canada and the United States, and I think that this is a trend that we're going to see as people see the need to have an academic focus on safety that links the knowledge from uh, practical experience with the tools, uh, the research tools, and the, and the knowledge of social science um, and other, other important aspects of the academic uh, curriculum. In addition to the uh, standard academic programs, there are a number of important programs that emerge in North America, and in particular, I, I, I mentioned two here, the Veterans Administration Quality Scholars Program, uh, which has created a huge uh, interest in a variety of centers across the U.S., and then the Harvard Fellowship in Patient Safety and Quality have also created new, new opportunities for education. So, Naomi, I'm going to pass it back to you um, to, to think about these issues a little more. So, thanks, Ross. And um, before um, we start um, thinking about those issues, just wanted to uh, mention um, the centres that we managed to include uh, from mainland Europe. So, we uh, conducted interviews with five uh, improvement science centres um, on, in mainland Europe. And what we found from those was that they mostly developed in response to uh, local interests and emerging opportunities. And there are just three examples here. Um, the first at Chalmers University in Gothenburg uh, in Sweden has developed a centre for healthcare improvement um, to support um, their local healthcare organisations interest in a, in a more scientific approach to quality improvement. Uh, the University Medical Centre at Utrecht have developed a patient safety centre, uh, really from the chief executive's um, prioritisation of, of safety research. And um, the Institute of Health Policy and Management at Erasmus University and IQ Scientific Institute at University Medical Centre Radboud have um, developed a joint centre prioritising new challenges like global health and e-communications. So now I want to uh, pass back to you, Ross, uh, to uh, summarize our findings so far. So I think uh, the scan has given us an opportunity to see the types of centers that have emerged in a broad range of geographic centers. And we see an enormous uh, amount of activity that's happening, which I think reflects several things. It reflects the fact that healthcare quality has become a really important issue in North America, in the UK, on the continent, and we recognize increasingly that there's a broad range of disciplines and approaches that are relevant to our understanding of how to improve uh, quality. But the existing centers are often quite heterogeneous and often have framed their agendas in very different ways. And so part of the challenge here is to think about how we can create a dialogue across these centers, people with different backgrounds, different interests, but really an overarching concern and, and interest in bringing academic knowledge and research to bear on these important problems of healthcare quality, patient safety, um, and efficiency. So we have now a series of, of academic enterprises that provide the base to do this, and, and one of our challenges is to figure out how to use that base to really move forward. As I've already said, uh, there are a number of centers that have seen the, the challenges of their own funding as an opportunity to really focus in on the areas that are best funded, patient safety, informatics, 
Um, so that's, a, I think, an important development which gives us deeper knowledge in those areas, but also raises the challenge of how we link uh, those centers into a broader, uh, broader agenda. And as the, shift, uh, com the shifts come in funding, uh, we also see shifts in the focus of the centers. So that's an additional challenge to deal with this heterogeneous uh, relationship between the, between the centers. So Naomi, I'll, I'll uh, pass it back to you to talk a little bit about continuing challenges. Thanks, Ross. So um, thinking about this scan and what we found, we're identifying some um, challenges to improvement science centres uh, that we think are there. And uh, we'd really like to hear your feedback on um, whether these are the right ones uh, and um, how, how you might be addressing them in your, uh, in your centre or where you are. So first of all, this uh, first point links to the point that Ross just made about um, the type of funding. So it raises issues about sustainable funding to support research and education in improvement science centres. Many of these centres have time limited funding funding and are the whim of um, research funders uh, in terms of their uh, continuing uh, uh, ongoing uh, work. Um, secondly, um, our uh, findings raise the issue about um, whether we can develop a graduate curriculum that links improvement science to underlying disciplinary knowledge, uh, be that the whole range of social sciences, through engineering, clinical sciences, and so on. Uh, a number of other challenges relate to um, the sustainable long-term partnerships between academic and healthcare organisations. Uh, as we know, they have different drivers, uh, different motivations, uh, and what does that say for the, um, the uh, long-term sustainability of these partnerships? And, and therefore, what are the most effective models for such uh, 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 such units. Uh, again, we'd be interested to hear from you uh, the models that you know about that you've experienced uh, that seem to be uh, successful or perhaps um, less successful. Um, another set of uh, challenges, as I've said, um, the, um, the Improvement Science Centres uh, need to balance uh, the uh, institutional imperatives of universities and healthcare organisations uh, which don't always uh, coincide. Um, so that is uh, very challenging and, and how can we do that in, in the most fruitful way. Um, and linked to that, thinking about developing the capacity of researchers in this field, um, it seems like um, we need uh, different kinds of researchers to uh, undertake this kind of work. Um, as Jonathan Lomas, uh, the former director of the Canadian Health Services Research Foundation said, um, this is a contact sport. Um, we need to be getting out there, building relationships. Uh, it's no longer uh, the in, uh, health service researcher can sit in, a, in a, a room and lock the door and undertake their research without uh, talking to anyone. So this implies uh, different kinds of training uh, for our researchers and uh, we, need to, we need to think about that. So I'm just going to pass you back to Ross now uh, to finish up with uh, some of the challenges we've been thinking about. So, Naomi, you mentioned this sort of interesting challenge about people from different disciplines who have different focus uh, on these issues. And I think that that leads us into an interesting challenge, a uh, broader challenge, which is how to create more of a dialogue between the various centers that have used particular tools, particular methods, particular ways of framing problems so we have a richer, broader science that talks across the various different ways in which we can address these issues. And I think the Health Foundation has been uh, very, uh, very helpful in terms of bringing together people with different perspectives who can address these epidemiological and epistemological issues so we can think about the contributions of different sciences to the question about how do we build a knowledge base to help improve care. And so uh, that's one of the things I hope that this work will continue to focus on. It's not just a question of the different foci of these centers, but it's a question of creating an understanding about what the science in total looks like and what sorts of methods, what sorts of approaches are going to be useful for the different problems that we see in different parts of the healthcare system. The health, the health Foundation's created this Improvement Science Development Group, but that's only a small group of people. So we need to reach out to the broader community to have a variety of views and opportunities to contribute to these dialogues. And I hope that this 
webinar, it gives us the first opportunity to have some of that dialogue about the nature of the improvement science activities going on in these different centers and the opportunities then to link between the issues, the approaches, the methods that exist in these different centers. So I'll turn it back to you, Bill, to really say a little bit more about this as well. Thank you very much, Ross. Thanks a lot, uh, Naomi. That's a wonderful overview. Um, great questions coming in already, and there's a clutch of them uh, immediately to do with the curriculum of improvement science. And I'm going to start there. And some of them take an approach which questions uh, what is it and which disciplines have a contribution to make. And if you like, that's a sort of horizontal view. And some of them take a really interesting vertical view. Uh, there's a question about uh, the research team is fo has focused on uh, graduate and postgraduate uh, study. There's a question here about whether or not uh, we might expect to see more examples at undergraduate level. So I'm going to invite Ross, you to start off uh, in any way you like there. The, the curriculum of improvement science, what did you find? So we didn't go into great detail on the curriculum issues, and I think that's an important next step to, that we have to address. So what are the core elements? And there have been a number of groups that have done some work thinking about the core competencies of patient safety and quality improvement. And I know in our own work here, as we've developed our own curriculum on improvement science, we've looked at those different uh, competency frameworks as a way to compare and contrast. But it's, uh, it's still early days to build some sort of sense of what the range is of the, of the particular skills and knowledge that is necessary. I think one of the advantages of having this heterogeneous groups of centers out there and the programs that they've developed so it gives us a rich opportunity to go out and see what people have learned as they have embarked on new curricula and new opportunities to develop improvement science efforts. Thanks. And, and your perspective on that, Naomi? I'd like to pick up this issue about um, undergraduate, uh, uh, the undergraduate curriculum. And what we found mostly is that people were focusing at postgraduate level, um, but um, I think the, the, que the person who's put the question is a very good one, that um, we should be collectively thinking about how we uh, uh, address the undergraduate curriculum and find ways of raising issues uh, uh, relating to improvement science at uh, undergraduate level uh, for medical nursing and, uh, and other healthcare professionals. So it's not something that comes to them uh, later and we miss out on people. They're thinking about it hopefully from very early on starting their um, professional training. Mm. Did you find any evidence at all of undergraduate study in this emerging area? Oh yeah, there's a lot of that, I think, Bill. I mean, I think medicine, nursing in, in North America and other professions uh, really see this as a critical issue now, and there's big initiatives uh, in, in North American um, universities to deal with this. Um, but I think it's still, it still needs to go farther. And I, Naomi may, may be able to comment more on what the UK situation is, but I think the problem is that we need to build uh, a consistent set of training and resources and methods and tools so we have a language, we have a, we have a series of sciences that are seen as important here. And it's still early days now in defining what those are, I think. OK, I'm not going to put Naomi on the spot there, but I'm going to ask uh, to, to move on a little bit, if we could, into you. You've mentioned the sciences. What are, what are the disciplines that you found from your scan to be currently contributing to this wonderful dialogue that we're calling improvement science? And let me start with you, Naomi. What kind of disciplines are showing up on the scan? So on the scan, um, mostly um, it's the social sciences uh, with health service research and clinical sciences. Um, with um, less um, emphasis on, on bringing in things like uh, uh, disciplines like um, engineering, say for example, although there are some examples of that. Um, and I think uh, we would um, argue that uh, we need to think, we do need to think more broadly about the, the disciplines that come in. And also not just the disciplines, but sectors um, that um, health research tends to be uh, quite narrow uh, and parochial, uh, drawing only on health research rather than learning from um, research in education, for example. Um, there's a nice example, one of the clerks looking at what um, the police force, how the police force have been using research. So it's a, it's a range of disciplines, but also looking across sectors. Is that similar for you, Ross? You know, it, it's a little different in North America. I think that uh, the leaders of uh, improvement science in many of the North American centers have been clinicians who have then gained additional skills in patient safety or quality improvement. Uh, and now we see an increasing emphasis to bring, I think, more social scientists, more engineers 
into this um, into this activity. So it's currently, I would say that m most of the centers have a greater focus on the clinical sciences informed by quality improvement and patient safety. Uh, but I think. I think we see an increasing need to make this more of an interdisciplinary and broad uh, basis for these activities as well. Thanks very much, uh, Ross. Now, there's a whole series of other questions that uh, bring in a, a noun that we haven't mentioned yet. And obviously, all of this is about improving patient care. Um, and that's the implication of everything that we're doing here together. And I wondered whether in your, uh, your scanning you, d you discovered centers that are particularly expert or interested in engaging with the patient voice in improvement science. So, uh, Naomi, let me, let me look at you. What, what, what did you find here? So I think what we found was that um, it's a priority for all centers and um, they're approaching it in different ways. It's challenging to do well and meaningfully. Um, there are some uh, nice examples. The um, uh, Clark in the uh, Southwest Peninsula that I mentioned has made a particular uh, effort to uh, involve service users in the development of their programs from the very outset and there are um, other examples that, uh, that we picked up. But I think um, the important um, point is to, or one of the important points is to involve patients um, at the very outset uh, and not at the end when you've done your research, but at the outset in terms of building your centre, in terms of identifying the priorities, and then in, un in undertaking uh, particular uh, types of research and implementation projects to ensure that their perspectives are taken into account. Okay, uh, Ross, your perspective? So I agree entirely that this is important. I, I think that most of the centers that exist now uh, were not designed with patients at the table talking about what's important and how, to, how do we address these issues. But I think increasingly people are recognizing that in their planning and in their center activities, they need to figure out a way to have the patient voice at the table. So uh, almost inevitably with a conversation about disciplines, um, we have people uh, uh, inviting questions about disciplines we've not mentioned. So let me just uh, mention a, a few of them. One in particular, uh, the role of statistics uh, in validating improvement science. Uh, is this something uh, that you, you found in, in the North American centers, Ross? Yes, I think a very important issue is how do we, how do we uh, bring in the tools and methods of statistics. But as you know, there's, uh, there's several traditions of statistics, and one of the interesting uh, epistemological issues is the is the balance between analytic and numerative statistics and as we see now the the deepening of knowledge about quality improvement and how to do effective quality improvement we see this interesting dialogue that's emerging between people who are trained in more traditional areas of st statistics and those who've learned the analytic methods that are more broadly in use uh, in the field and so that's one of the really rich opportunities to figure out how do we bring those different tools together in a, in a situation that allows us to build a more effective science. And staying with you, Ross, uh, there's a question coming from Canada. Um, often the focus has been on tertiary services or health technology. Were there any centers looking at primary care or public health? Uh, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm just going through my mental model that, that it's not an area of big focus. But I think it's uh, one that's coming increasingly on the radar screen. So if people are looking for areas of opportunity, I think primary care in particular is a, is a big opportunity. And here's another one, um, which I guess is inevitable too, given that we're uh, talking about different terms. Um, we've got a, a question here which may be uh, answerable or unanswerable. What is the difference between implementation science and what we used to call the science of change management? And the questioner goes on, is change management less evidence-based and more consultant experience-based? Um, Naomi, can I start with you? Yes, I think uh, many of these terms are um, interchangeable uh, in some ways, but in other ways they draw on different literatures um, which um, we need to draw in, in fact. So I wouldn't say that uh, change management is less evidence-based. Um, there's some very... Uh, 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 good work in the literature and good evidence-based models uh, for change management. Um, but these um, different traditions and literatures need to be brought in, in together to see what we, how we can best learn uh, to um, translate research into practice and improve um, patient care. And uh, both of you now, were there connections between, uh, you mentioned medical schools and uh, social sciences and sociology, 
were there other schools that you've not mentioned uh, thus far which featured? I mean, I'm thinking of management of business schools. Did they, did they feature in the scan? Uh, Ross, let's start with you. Uh, no, I don't think that I know of any management schools in North America that have, uh, that have a big focus on this. They certainly, there's many of them that have individual scholars who are doing work, but we were looking at sort of a corpus of activity around improvement science. And so, I, but engineering is, is clearly uh, in, in the ball game, and there's a number of schools that have seen this as important, uh, where engineers work collaboratively with uh, clinicians and others to, uh, to bring the knowledge and, and research that they have to bear on the issues of patient care. Thank you. Uh, that may be a little different in, in uh, UK, Naomi. Do you have a thought on that? Uh, yes. I mean, a number of the centres um, that we included, I mean, when, when we talk about partnerships between universities and healthcare organisations, that the university, um, it, often there are partnerships within that universities across different schools. So um, you have health, broadly health schools, that schools of nursing, medicine and so on, collaborating with management, business schools, schools of social sciences and so on. That's fairly common in the okay. UK. Um, there's a really good question here. It's, uh, it's detailed. Forgive me, I'm going to read it very carefully from, from, from my tablet here. Um, improvement science should be the duty of any healthcare professional. I'm an ophthalmologist, uh, op ophthalmologist with a strong interest in research. However, I always find it's up to me to create a link between my research and my clinical practice. And the trust usually struggles to suffer to offer any form of backup unless I bring in the funding. Shouldn't improvement science be promoted more actively in hospitals rather than mainly aiming at academics or medics with an interest in academia? And uh, I know there are different takes on this. Let me start with you, Ross. Uh, do, do you warm to that? Do you identify with that? Absolutely. I agree entirely. I mean, I think, I mean, the reason why we're focused on improvement science is we want to bring together this rich set of knowledge and skills to actually inform uh, the practitioners who are going to be working on, on patient care in, in, the next, in the next decades, right? So, so the issue is to create a knowledge base that's going to be practical to inform the development of the next generation of practitioners and the development of continuing knowledge about how to move uh, what we learn from research into practice. I think that's exactly the right question. Uh, Nemi, you're nodding too. Is that, is that a, a, a similar bit of empathy? No, I think it's a very good question. And I think it raises the issue about um, moving away from ad hoc support uh, for this endeavour to um, um, structures within healthcare organisations as well as within academic organisations to support this work. So exactly to support practitioners in healthcare organisations uh, who are undertaking improvement science to, to implement uh, and improve, uh, improve their practice. Okay. One of your findings, if, I, if I've read it correctly, was uh, a kind of uncertainty of funding for some of these centres. They've, they've grown up through uh, a, a very powerful individual or a particular uh, locus, focus of attention. Um, do you have any thoughts about the sustainability of the kind of centres you scanned? If you were to scan them again in a couple of years' time, will they be there? What, what, what did it look like to you, uh, Ross? Well, we did have a couple of centers where they told us that uh, they weren't going to be sustained and they were thinking about uh, what the future was for their research endeavors because their funding had disappeared. And we had other centers who said that they decided to be absolutely razor clear in their focus to, to hit on the issues where there are no their existing funding streams and to move away from a broad-based uh, attempt to focus on broader improvement science issues. And so it, that raises exactly the question we have. Uh, have posed in this scan, which is how do we create an ongoing basis for broad scale improvement science that allows us to bring in a range of tools and disciplines? Because it's a very complex uh, set of issues in the practice environment and in the academic environment to bring together people who have different training, different ways of thinking about research issues, but whose contribution to the larger endeavor is really important. So we see a number of centers that really have spent a lot of time uh, bringing the people together from different different disciplines and achieved a lot, but it's it's not easy easy work and it takes takes time to get results. And so I think the pressures for people now to look for quick opportunities to move to new sources of funding moves against the I think the real need to develop an understanding of the broader platform of improvement science and how we use that to create and inform clinicians managers and others in our healthcare system so it doesn't become something apart from the nature of healthcare but something integrated into the nature of healthcare. 
So you've taken the uh, you've taken a kind of a, a litmus test scan of the the system at the moment. Do you do you find it to be healthy? Is this are we talking about a growing area? Do you think uh, here, Naomi, or is that difficult to define from a from a from, from a, just a snapshot? Um, it's, I think it is a growing area. Um, although you're right, it is a snapshot. And but even in the the snapshot <laughs> over a few months, as Ross has said, it is a movable feast. And we heard about centres uh, closing. On the other hand, there are centres that have a long history. Um, so um, if the map w we showed you earlier is only at a you know a particular uh, point in time. And as you say, if we go back in a year, some of those centres may not be there. However, new ones um, um, may have grown. I think overall. I, th I think we'd probably say it is a growing area. There's increasing interest um, in this whole field, um, both in terms of, uh, of healthcare organisations uh, 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 that want to improve the quality of the care they give, yeah. uh, and in terms of researchers who want to um, 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 see their uh, results implemented in practice. Okay, I want to bring together a couple of observations you both made and uh, two or three questions. Uh, the observation uh, came uh, uh, very, very strongly uh, from Ross, uh, thinking about the, uh, the different ways that uh, different centres might, may or may not communicate with each other. Um, and I'm very interested to know whether or not you found evidence of, both from within Canada or within the States, interdisciplinary collaboration between centres. And indeed in the UK, there's a specific question about the degree to which you think these centres are collaborating. And at another moment, I think, uh, Ross, you spoke of the Health Foundation's Improvement Science Development Group, and you rightly characterised it as a small group. And so there's a big interest. There are a number of people who are uh, inviting you both to give them some advice about how, if they're not engaged now, if they're not in a, either a medical institution or a university institution, which sees this as an appropriate thing to be doing, how could they, as it were, join the club? How can they get involved? Your, your, your thoughts, please. Naomi, let me start with you. So, uh, first of all, in terms of whether centres are collaborating with each other, um, I think we found a lot of evidence for that, and um, uh, interna both internationally and within people's uh, own countries. Um, and obviously, anything that um, we can do to support that, I think, would be really uh, useful in terms of helping us uh, learn from each other. Uh, and also particularly the international comparisons uh, can be very helpful. Of course, within, um, within a particular country, you have to acknowledge that, that, that these centres are also competing uh, mm. with each other, uh, uh, particularly uh, for funding. Um, however, um, academics have a long tradition of, uh, of collaboration, so I think that, that kind of that, that, out, that out wins it. Okay. Ross, your, your take on that? So I, you know, I think there's a number of ways in which people are already trying to join the club, as it were, a number of, of attempts to bring people together who have an interest, but they have been within particular, um, particular subsets, if you will, of the broader world of improvement science. So there's a very active and growing uh, group of scholars engaged in, in implementation science, um, and then there's groups of scholars who have worked for the last decade on patient safety issues and there's a variety of conferences there and so the real I think the real challenge is not to the work within those groups but figuring out ways that those groups can now have a conversation with each other and I know there's a number of of key individuals in some of those streams that have been asking the question so how do we link to these different uh, areas of activity so so I'm hopeful that Places like the Health Foundation will see that as an important sort of avenue to move forward to create those channels of communication between the different ongoing traditions and you know institutions of the, those research trends. Okay, thanks both. I'm going to take us off into a slightly different direction. We've touched on this in an earlier webinar. Uh, Harvey Shijana talked uh, a lot about uh, peer-reviewed, scholarly peer-reviewed publication work in improvement science, and I. Just wondered whether you had, and one questioner here is particularly interested in the sustaining foundations of the academic work that underpin improvement science, and uh, wondered what your findings were regarding strategies for bridging between improvement science publication and what this person refers to as the academic literature that is built on more traditional research methodologies. There, there are sorts of begged questions in the question itself. Uh, what are your thoughts about that and the kind of state of improvement science uh, publication, peer-reviewed publications? Uh, Ross, let me start with you because you're very close to uh, an important editor in that area. Yes. Well, I mean, I have to say I think there's some very, uh, very good outlets for academic publication and improvement science now. 
and an increasing interest of uh, journal editors in non-improvement science journals in this in this topic. So uh, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of work in the BMJ, for example. Uh, we're seeing work in uh, in in journals like Millbank, which are are not improvement science journals that really address these issues about the underlying uh, really concerns and issues about how do we what are the mechanisms by which we improve care. Um, so I you know, I think actually if you if you start to look where these the, the Health Foundation does, an does a scan of the research in this area that they release every month, which is very helpful, and the range of, of journals that these articles appear in is quite broad. So I think that's a very healthy sign. Mm. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, just a real-world clutch of questions now. Hey, we're broke. You know, there isn't enough money to go around. Uh, and we're not just talking about the academic institutions, we're talking about healthcare internationally. How does improvement science and how do improvement science centers hold their heads up in the middle of a global recession? Naomi. So that's why we need improvement science even more, because uh, with decreasing resources, we need to know how best to use them and to ensure that we're paying for healthcare uh, that really is uh, effective um, and high quality. So um, I would argue there's a stronger case for it uh, in the current climate. Uh, not, a, not a weaker one. Having said that, um, we need to, everyone undertaking this endeavour needs to take that context into account uh, and ensure that you know, the work that we're all doing uh, is, 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 is to help uh, us all uh, improve uh, patient care within, within the difficult context that we find ourselves in. Ross, similar in uh, North America as well? Yes, I think so. I think people now see that this is the path forward, is to try and figure out what are the methods that we can use to um, improve the value of healthcare, uh, to improve the, improve the results and to keep the costs um, uh, minimized, the cost, the cost increases. So, I mean, I live in uh, the province of Ontario, and the Ontario government is very keen on investing in, in uh, programs and activities to support improvement science, and that's so, and I think that's not, we're not alone in that. I see that uh, in uh, various parts of the U.S. now, there's a huge investment in uh, um, in effectiveness research, and and so I think the the key is to figure out how to do this in a way that's going to be sustainable and that's going to draw on the experience and learning that we've had in other disciplines and other centers in things that are that have different labels. So part of the part of the challenge is to create a, a more robust, a more inclusive science of improvement. And if we, if we took that question as a global invitation, uh, as a questioner here, uh, pondering out loud whether or not you discovered anything about work in developing countries, whether improvement science is featuring at all on your radar there, or, or whether there, any of the centers were collaborating with uh, developing countries. Naomi, did you find anything there? Anything, anything uh, come to mind? There are um, one or two centers uh, that sort of appeared in the search, and then it was hard to find out more information. Um, but I think a number of the, the centres are, um, are, are, have themes of global health and are partnering uh, uh, with um, institutions and uh, healthcare organisations uh, in uh, more developing countries. And I think it's a, a growth area uh, uh, for that uh, area of the world uh, as well, as they also you know, need to think about how best to use resources in, in, in terms of healthcare. Thanks. Uh, Ross, related to, to this, in a sense that it's a, it's a, it's a deep question about money and resource, uh, here's a specific question. Uh, how do drug companies, which are more profit-driven than otherwise, fit into this web of uh, improvement science? Did they feature at all in your scan? Uh, we didn't see any direct uh, influence of that, but of course, you know, there's always these issues about uh, when you have projects, uh, what sorts of support do you want? And I think that the, the key issue is just to make sure that any support that you get from that area is really focused on the broader questions that the knowledge you gain will be widely shared. And mm. then we, you know, we welcome the opportunities to open up these issues uh, for further research. And uh, inevitably, you've uncovered uh, centers of sub substance. There's a questioner here just speculating out loud about should we be relying on funders to, de to determine the improvement science agenda? How can we support very specialist and small group research activities that maybe wouldn't show up on a scan like yours. Any thoughts? 
you know, that's a good question. There's lots of issues, and I, I you know, we wouldn't want to discourage people from from taking a more specific area of inquiry uh, because I think that's really important. But our task was really to try and identify the range of activities and then to think in particular about the ways in which these activities are similar or different from each other as a broad platform for moving forward for improvement science. Okay, thank you both. Uh, uh, we're about five minutes away from uh, moving to a close here, so uh, just an opportunity if there are, is a question that you're uh, really burning to submit, then uh, please uh, send, us, send us that one now. Um, in a moment, I'm going to invite you both just to reflect on what you've learned from the process of scanning these improvement science uh, centers. Uh, but before I do that, I want to go back to um, some of the questions that you yourself posed and just look across to see whether we've uh, touched on those. Um, you talked a little bit uh, uh, in the very last slide, uh, Ross, about fruitful epistemological debate being encouraged um, and the kind of underpinning methods and theories used to advance the debate. And a number of questioners have said, did you find any theories that were particularly uh, efficacious here? And I just wondered whether that's too soon to ask that question or whether you have any insights to share on that? I think, I think there are no easy, quick answers on that. But I think one of the things we see emerging is an increasing recognition of the value of uh, social science and uh, engineering science in the, in the uh, broader improvement world. And I think that's really to the good. So, so there's a number of centers uh, increasingly we see uh, with that are looking to recruit social scientists to be part of their teams and to help ask different questions with different methods than the ones they've already asked. Uh, the issue is really the funding that's necessary to do that and how do we support the centers in, in broadening their, their lines of inquiry. Okay, Naomi, thoughts on that? Um, as Ross said, um, we weren't uh, going to um, detail in great depth in terms of um, what sorts of methods and, and, and theories the centres were using, um, but it seemed that they um, were very diverse, um, as, is, as is quite right. And I think maybe the, the social science input um, to the uh, uh, contribution to the UK centres might possibly be bigger than it is in, in, in the North, uh, North American ones, uh, which is uh, supporting this this whole work. Okay, um, last questions. They're two very detailed questions. Um, I'm going to read them out and then I'm going to invite you for that kind of all embracing what have you learned from the process of uh, undertaking the scan. So uh, question one, um, how do you intend to deal with uh, ethical challenges which may be particularly diverse in an improvement science setting? And uh, no pressure here. Uh, question two, what advances do you see in bedside to bench research in contrast to bedside to bench research? I think uh, that question should have been posed the other way around, but I think you know where they're coming from. So for a bedside to bench or bench to bedside, uh, what advances do you see and what's the contrast there? Nemi, I'm going to start with you, and that means I can uh, then end with Ross uh, uh, to round off our webinar. So um, in any order you like. Two challenging questions. So I think the ethical um, questions uh, uh, ethical issues is a really, really good question. Um, and one of them I just uh, like to throw out, which is um, in undertaking uh, work in partnership with healthcare organizations as researchers uh, in, uh, in the area of improvement, uh, one can uncover um, all sorts of things going on uh, that uh, don't, uh, don't look like improvement. And um, there's an ethical issue uh, about how one deals with those findings. I'm talking about where you find you know, unsafe, poor quality mm -hmm. care going on as part of your research. And it's very important to have had uh, discussions with your um, healthcare organization partners up front about how you're going to deal with that uh, and how they're going to deal with that, how you're going to share that information and how um, that's going to be uh, dealt with. So that's in terms of the ethical challenges. In terms of the um, bench to bedside, uh, uh, what we call T, T1 mm. type 1 translation, um, well, that is uh, funded at a much, much, much higher level uh, than the work that we're talking about. And uh, uh, um, while you know, we don't want to get into competition around uh, funding, um, that has been very well funded historically. And it may be now uh, funders are, 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 are switching a little bit uh, to realize that they should be, need to prioritize this type two translation that we're talking about in terms of um, proving healthcare delivery systems. 
And uh, your final question then, just the standing back and uh, you've undertaken this uh, scan. What have you learned? I think um, there's a huge amount of activity going on around the world. It's concentrated in certain areas of the world, it looks like at the moment. Um, and people are using different terms, um, uh, which in some ways, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, in some ways makes it difficult uh, to kind of create a movement to, to sort of bring it all together. So I, I think that's, that's challenging. And whether it's possible uh, to have uh, one term that everyone can, can feel comfortable with and, and, and come under um, is tricky. But I think uh, in terms of uh, working together across the centres internationally, we've got a huge amount to gain. Thanks so much. And uh, from your perspective, Ross, those, a couple of those detailed questions and then your, your more general reflections, please. So, uh, you know, the, the history of the development of improvement science is a very rich history, and, and it's led to, to very separate lines of inquiry. And I, I don't think we want to lose that richness. We want to hold on to that richness because there's, there's real advantage to seeing uh, what the specific skills are in different centers. At the same time, I think we need to have a broader map about how these pieces fit together so that people are making choices about where they're focusing and what they're including and how they link to other types of knowledge and skills. And so as we develop uh, masters and other programs, PhD programs in improvement science, we need to ask the question, so what's the appropriate curriculum that's going to help both to develop better methods to translate research from um, to the bedside and to also develop people with the skills uh, in their own daily work that they can ask the question so what what do I know about the appropriate ways to you know interact with my colleagues to move knowledge into practice to to change existing patterns of activity and so forth so it's a very exciting time but you know what when we finished this I had I had the frustration that although we knew a lot about particular centers we didn't know enough about what they were doing in terms of the specific areas of education and research and so I think both of the, in both of those areas we've now just opened the door for further thoughts and inquiry about uh, next steps. Thank you so much and that's a, a great place to pause. Thank you all for your wonderful questions and I apologize I haven't managed to pose all of them. Um, if any of your colleagues missed the webinar don't worry it'll soon be on the Health Foundation site alongside all the other webinars we've done in this series and of course you can download the, uh, the slides that you've been watching today. Uh, I'm struck very much by what both Ross and Naomi have said, that this is, a, as it were, a work in progress. It, it begs many more questions. We want to go deeper. We want to find out exactly what's uh, going on. It throws up so many uh, opportunities for local, regional, national, and international collaboration. And uh, this is really us, all of us, uh, uh, on behalf of the Health Foundation, inviting you to come into this big emerging tent and to join in and to contribute. Um, just by way of closing now, uh, I'm sure that you would want now, in whatever way is appropriate virtually, to thank our expert uh, presenters, Ross Baker and Naomi Fulop, most sincerely for a fabulous webinar. Thank you both very much.